Welcome to the webinar series, Women Behind the Mask. Today, we're meeting with an esteemed panel of women in leadership to discuss the topic of anti-fragility. Now, really, that centers around a concept coined by Nassim Taleb in his book, Anti-Fragility. He's also the author of Black Swan. And what this concept talks about is really the ability for people and organizations to withstand extreme stress, volatility, um, and adverse situations. I think we can all agree that the last year and 2020 has certainly ticked all the boxes of extreme volatility, extreme stress, and adverse conditions. And we're speaking today to three leaders in business, how you can thrive under conditions of stress and whether we're able as organizations, as a country, and as individuals to rise to the occasion and show growth during this very, very difficult time. So thank you for joining us. And I'd like to introduce the first of our panelists. We're very privileged to have with us today, uh, Geraldine Fraser Molaketi, who is a well-known figure and leader in the African continent, really a pioneer of social and economic transformation. Uh, Geraldine has held many positions, both in leadership in government, where she held various ministerial uh, positions, as well as more recently in business, uh, where she serves on two listed boards. And I don't have enough time, Geraldine, to go through your career and all the leadership positions that you hold. But we are very privileged to have you with us today. So welcome. The next person I would like to introduce is Samara Tataram. Samara is the CFO of Stadio a private higher education institution focused on empowering the nation by providing access in South Africa to higher education and, bro and broadening the access to higher education. Samara, you also have experience and wide experience in investments and private equity um, and, and even more as a CFA charter holder um, and holding various leadership positions uh, in the industry. So welcome. And we really look forward to your input in the panel today. Then, Nonfantla Mayasela, uh, or as I refer to her, and we at Investec lovingly refer to her as Noni. Welcome today. Nonfantla is the CEO of Izandla Property um, and also the national chairperson of the Women's Property Network. Uh, we're very privileged to have you here today and looking forward to your input to this conversation. Noni, if you would not mind kicking us off, uh, we would really like to hear from you. During this time of tribulation that we've been through, the pandemic that has really um, been challenging to all of us, um, as a woman leader in the organization that you're responsible for and a CEO, which is a, uh, sometimes a, a heavy burden and a big privilege, um, how have you thought about resilience at an organizational level in your business? And what have you done to prepare your organization to face the shocks um, you know, that we've seen and also that we most likely will continue to see. Thank you, Rene. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to contribute to this discussion. Um, sure. I think for me, the one thing I've learned about resilience during this time is that it's a finite resource um, and eventually it does run out. So, and maybe a bit of background to our business and, and our landscape, um, it, you know, it will help me to answer the question. But we operate in the real estate space, so the understood real estate space. Izanda is, a, is an empowered fund and relatively small, I guess, if you look at the other players that are um, uh, in the South African real estate context, it's a fairly new business. So three years old, um, big aspirations. We were right in the crux of our growth phase as, as a business. So the last three years were very um, volatile, unstable. We did experience a bit of growth. And we were really looking forward to taking this business to, to the next level, certainly in, in 2020. Um, come COVID, we get sent into a massive whirlwind. And, and I think, I mean, you mentioned the word prepared. And, and I think no leader could have been prepared for, for what came. And we just, we just had to keep going. So, I mean, what our business looked like, certainly the first part of 2020, was just keeping afloat. Um, so our business model is really based on tenants um, paying us rent. So as you can imagine, and we operate across um, um, a diverse pool of tenants in the commercial, industrial, and retail space. Um, when tenants are not occupying property, the first thing they do is not pay rent. Um, and we rely on that rental income to keep our doors open as a business and particularly to service our financial obligations. Because on the other side, we, you know, we funded our property. 
So the first thing we had to do was to ensure that we protect our income. And, and we're very focused on that. Um, I've got a very small team, which I think one is a privilege and a disadvantage. Um, a privilege in that when you are dealing with team dynamics and trying to get a team to pull together in a very difficult and uncertain time, if the team is big, that challenge is um, is quite significant. But because we're small, I think everyone knows what everyone is doing at the same time. We are streamlined in our approach. So we were able to kind of get stuck in and ensure that if for six months we are protecting revenue, that's what our focus is. Um, and luckily, I mean, we, we we managed to weather the storm. So I think for me, the, the, the theme that stood out um, is, yes, resilience, which I said for me is a finite resource and it does run out. I think the thing that, is, that has stood out for me as, as a leader and what has been important in driving the team is consistency, um, compassion, and, and I think steadfastness. Um, certainly from my perspective, consistency in a very uncertain time is critical for any team. Um, to focus on, on, on what the, the, the immediate deliverable is. Um, and I think in times where a leader panics, um, there's, there's, you know, like I said, great anxiety around where the business is going to be in a couple of months' time, you have to force yourself to be consistent in the message that you put across to your team. Compassion for me was critical during this time. Um, and maybe it's just a number of events that took place within our team, but I realized that the one thing that the team needed um, is, is to get that sense of reassurance and compassion. Um, I think, you know, our team knows what they need to do, but we all went through our own personal challenges. And in the absence of appreciating that with your team and within your organization, you may find yourself losing key people um, in your business that are no longer committed because they just don't have the capacity. So for me, those are the things that have, that have, that have stood out and have, have, have actually um, uh, put us in good stead um, and, and has ensured that we kind of weather the 2020 storm. We don't know what 2021 brings us, but we are here and the team is in a much better place. The organization is in a much better place within the midst of a very uncertain environment. You mentioned compassion, um, you know, working as a team, uh, standing together, being consistent. Samara, earlier in the week when you and I spoke, something you were quite passionate about was really normalizing the concept of strain that individuals and teams are experiencing and the mental health and emotional well-being impact, um, you know, that that is felt. And um, you mentioned that this was something that was really not in the forefront or being discussed uh, enough. Do you want to comment on that? Um, I fully agree with what Noni said about compassion. You know, it's understanding the different, um, you know, the, the, the different backgrounds um, of your team. But I think specifically, you know, we were all thrown in this very uncertain environment. You know, um, you know, we had to sit with trying to actually provide focus, provide calmness where a lot of your staff were anxious and there were different, you know, ends of the scale. There were those who were like, oh, this is, you know, it's fake. It's not really an issue. And those who are actually really, really paranoid. And the interesting that I found, the interesting thing that I have found is that this is not something that can be addressed, you know, in an individualistic perspective. And as Nani said, it's actually pulling together the team, recognizing that everybody has different backgrounds. Some have young kids, some have kids that are at school, um, some have family with serious comorbidities, um, and actually just being flexible in the approach in terms of how do you accommodate the various staff to actually, you know, still deliver. There's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, we work in the higher education space, a big portion of what we had to grapple with is how do we make sure that our students are looked after? And I'm actually very humbled by, you know, the staff at Stadio that have actually stepped up and, you know, provided that additional support to their own detriment to, the, to an extent, you know, it absorbed a lot of like mental capacity, it absorbed a lot of emotional capacity, being there for your students, being there for your fellow colleagues. Um, and it created, uh, you know, an environment where, you know, we had to stop and ask every time, you know, our staff, are you okay? Do you need time? 
And it's a big thing. And I, it's, it's, it's definitely something that I promote amongst my team. You know, I can't tell you when you are tired and need to take a break, but you need to actually be bold enough to step up and say, I am exhausted. I am frazzled. I cannot concentrate. I cannot give my all because I just don't have any, any energy to give. And in a situation like that, it is okay to say, take a step back. Take a few days off, take a week off, and then come back refreshed, come back energized, because it's only when you are energized can you actually give your all to the organization. And I think it's something that's not spoken about a lot. And, and I just want to add, it's specifically women, where, you know, it's we feel it's a weakness to ask for help. It's, you know, we feel it's a weakness not to, you know, to say, I'm struggling a little bit. Um, I need a moment. I'm not... Um, concentrating properly, we're always afraid to actually step up and say, you know, I'm human. I have these um, experiences. I have these feelings um, because it's kind of not PC in the corporate world. And I do encourage people to actually say, you know, stand up and say, I need a break. I need to take a few days. I need to consolidate. I need to come back a little bit more refreshed because when you have a break, then you have a, you know, you have refreshed individuals and then you actually have a productive work, workforce. And in that situation, you can actually deal with a lot of the curveballs that come your way. So that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks, Renee. Thank you so much, Samara, for sharing that with us. I think a lot of women look at leaders like yourselves and think, you know, they're just super women. Uh, they never have a moment of weakness. And I think for you to share, you know, that you might be feeling like that at times is, is very brave and I think very necessary. We certainly have seen that at Investec as well, that helping people through just being human, uh, whether it's men or women, we all have those moments and uh, sharing with each other, making ourselves vulnerable um, and helping each other has really been one of the secrets to, to success. So Geraldine, I would like to come to you on that note because when people look at your career and you and I spoke a bit earlier in the week, I was actually struck by the fact that you know, the first thing you said to me is my rise to leadership was not traditional uh, and the route that you took to get to the positions that you held um, in your career, you know, was certainly full of pitfalls, challenges in a time in our society when uh, women were not necessarily supported as leaders. I think you, you showed immense resilience and tenacity to get through those moments. And I'm struck by the energy you still have for your passion and purpose of transforming society um, and, you know, the economy in South Africa. So I want to ask you and take you back to a story you told me um, earlier in the week, very early on in your career, in fact, at high school, when you ran for uh, president of the Student Representative Council and you were up against somebody um, and, you know, you lost that race. Um, what did you learn through that process and what made you persevere and, and what was the driving force behind the resilience that you showed to then go on to some very, um, you know, high powered leadership roles in your career? Thank you, Rene, and it's really great to be on this panel with uh, Noni and Samara this morning. So thank you for that. Um, I, I want to talk about three journeys, if I can call it that, you know, and I'd also want to link with my fellow panelists. So firstly, yes, I ran for the SRC, but what was quite uh, clear to me was the message. So what is the compact that you present to your constituency? If we can use the high school as a constituency. So just back in time, this was around 1975. It was just at a time when student representative councils were being formed and being formed at high schools. I obviously as a woman, then a young girl was running against uh, a boy who was a lot more specific than I was on message. He uh, looked at very concrete uh, uh, commitments for the high school pupils, students, that would benefit them immediately. I spoke about uh, the then challenges in what was called Southwest Africa. And they turned to Renal, and I think I lost uh, 
the constituency in the process. So the first message was be very clear what it is that you are offering and be on target with that. So it was a learning for me. But as you pointed out, it didn't set me back. So I want to then take a leap forward and I'd like to link it into what uh, Noni and Samara raised. And they spoke about compassion, mental health, and I want to add the whole concept of solidarity because I, I think that that is absolutely fundamental during the challenging times that we have been through um, across the globe because this is not unique to South Africa. And that's the ability to be able to come together and support, which is to this anti-fragility idea. And I like the fact that Samara said, uh, sorry, it was Noni that said, uh, she said resilience can run out. Anti-fragility actually says bounce back and you come out even greater. So I want to take you on a journey when I was in the African Development Bank. And this was at the peak of the Ebola pandemic. And the bank itself, together with the World Health Organization, were very clear that we can't have the closing off of Liberia, Guinea, Conakry, and Sierra Leone. Because if the countries were completely isolated, it was going to impact on the livelihoods of people there. And a similar debate to what we, what we have today around lives versus livelihoods was a debate then. No flights going in and all. And the women of Liberia and Sierra Leone actually wrote to me and said, we need you to come out. We need you to come and meet with us. We have challenges. And our problem is not only what happens during Ebola. It's how do we ensure that the women are able to bounce back and be in a better position post-Ebola. So when Dr. Donald Kabaruka, the president of the Development Bank, went to Liberia along with the head of the WHO for Africa, he said to me, you should accompany me. Now, many people would say, crazy, how do you go in during the eye of the storm? And I think that was an incredible moment, incredible from the point of view that the women there reached out and says, said, we're looking to the future, even though the current looks dismal. And the fact that we as the African Development Bank said, we've got to respond, but our response is to fly in and to say if, to everyone, you cannot cut off these countries. Thank you. Noni, I, I want to ask you, uh, you know, Geraldine made a few very interesting points there around, um, you know, going in at the eye of the storm and, you know, doing something controversial. Um, in your career, you know, it's very clear that you are one of the few uh, women in the property sector and you've really spearheaded as chairman of the um, women in Property Network. I want to ask you, um, do you think that women bring a different perspective to the sector uh, or in leadership? Do you think that women have different qualities that can benefit, uh, particularly during times of crisis? There have been some studies that would refer to the fact that potentially women have some qualities that are actually very valuable in time of crisis. What has your experience been in terms of this? Thanks, Jenny. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, the, the, the purpose of diversity is, is to bring different thinking and robust thinking. And ultimately, you come out with a better answer. So I think for me, the first thing um, is, you know, women providing a different voice is one thing. Um, I think we as women sitting around the table one want to add economic value and achieve economic value from whatever contribution um, we are we are providing. So I think for me, I mean, the one thing that has stood out, and, and funny enough, we I have a, an all female team, and um, the one thing, and I mean, my stakeholders are varied, right? Male, female, and stakeholders. I mean, clients, shareholders, uh, lenders, etc. But the one thing that's that has stood out for me is the sense of calm that women bring to the table. I've kind of always known this. Um, and I think it speaks to our ability to be measured 
um, in, in our approach and, and, and be very considerate, even in the midst of, of the worst crisis. Um, I think women are, are always allowing themselves the room to, to apply their minds before, um, you know, you kind of give input or, or make a decision, um, which is critical at this point in time. I think it's very easy to have knee-jerk reactions because one is feeling uncertain and fearful and, and, and make the, the wrong decisions. So I think for me, the first thing is women's ability to be measured um, and, and to assess the situation from a position of, um, of, of calmness and not, and not crisis is critical to any discussion um, uh, at this point in time. And I think the one other thing, and I, and, you know, I come back to, 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 to this compassion, because if you're sitting around the table and there's an issue, you know, that's been put on the table, I think there, there is data that is presented. There are things that are visibly clear around whatever the particular challenge or the problem is. But I think women are able to see beyond what's in front of them. Um, and, and I think any, any decision that an organization makes um, requires people. And with people, there are backgrounds. Samara mentioned this. With people, there's a level of, of compassion and, and, and emotional intelligence that you always have to apply to you know, enable people to, to, to come up with the right solutions. So I, I certainly think that there's, there's significant value that women add in, in just the way we, 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 we are made, the way in which we approach things, um, which is very different to men and, and, and really does um, does complement it. I mean, the one thing that's come out, which is funny, I, I actually thought women panic more than men. But I think to the contrary, my experience certainly during this time is, uh, is certainly the opposite. I found some of my male colleagues, um, like I said, knee-jerk reaction, panic mode. And, and I mean, then you're in crisis. Nobody's able to apply their minds. Nobody's actually able to be effective, which is which is critical. I think what is what has also happened during this time is we 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 want to show that we're working. So in the absence of sitting around the table with your team, you're almost nervous that you know is everyone doing what they're supposed to be, and you almost want people to be on their um, you know laptop for twelve or fourteen hours a day to demonstrate that they're working. But the big question is, are people being effective? Which which then requires you to take a step back and say, you know, what is it that we need to do to create that type of environment? And I think that type of thinking. Is something that is, I would say, is is unique to to women. Thank you, Noni. Certainly, diversity in a leadership team, in particular, you know, is is one of the things that I think is very very important. I also have teams uh, of leadership that. Um, you know, tend to be towards the female side. Um, and every now and then we do miss the male voice. So, um, you know, we it's important to have that diversity, I think, going both ways and, uh, and bring in all of the voices, both from a background as well as a gender um, uh, perspective. So, Samara, I just want to come back to you in terms of your experience in the education sector. Obviously, uh, the sector has been through huge turmoil, um, you know, and all the sensitivity, the emotion involved with schools, et cetera, over the last while. Just want to ask you, you know, in terms of your own personal experience in work-life balance, in managing all of the stress, is there any advice that you could give women? Um, you know, Noni referred to this concept that we need to demonstrate our value, demonstrate that we're working. Do you think that women do that more so than men? Do they feel... Uh, a higher burden and in your personal experience, you know, are there things that you can do to make sure that you don't burn out in this process? So we say as women and as mothers, um, you just want to get it done and you actually don't want to show any sign of weakness because A, you've got to be firm for your children. You've got to be, you know, the role model for your children. You've got to make sure the household is maintained and then if you are a career woman, which not everybody is, you also kind of, you know, want to be on a, on a career path as well. And that, that is challenging. So I'll be honest with you. Last year was a very, very challenging year. I've got two very young kids. I've got, at the time when we went into lockdown, I had um, a two-year-old and a five-year-old. Okay, so they've grown since. But that became very challenging because the requirements from a work perspective didn't stop. You know, so there was stuff that had to be had to be done without a doubt. 
the schools were closed, okay, which is the second element where you've got to play mummy, but at the same time, you know, manage teams and be on the leadership side. And to be honest, that was incredibly challenging. And I don't want to ever go back there, but we know, you know, we, if we get back there, we will manage it. But the reality is we have come through it, okay? So I've had a very supportive partner through it. And the piece of advice that I can actually give, the only piece of advice from my own experience was you have to ask for help, you know? So be it, you know, somebody who can help you with the kids, somebody who could help you with the household chores, even to do the washing, as an example. We always have a continuous stream of dishes in our house for some reason. But ask for help. Never be afraid to ask for help. And women, unfortunately, find that as a weakness. If I'm asking for help, it means I cannot do it. And I think that's just a complete and utter misnomer. And, you know, we talked about it. You cannot, you cannot solve the world's problems on your own. There is strength in the collective. So ask for help. Give up stuff, you know, because there's no point stretching yourself so thinly that you're giving pieces of yourself to different elements, but those pieces are not the best of you. And unfortunately, last year was the year where a lot of women found themselves incredibly thinly stretched, incredibly thinly stretched. Um, so the big thing I've got to say, ask for help. There is no weakness in asking for help. And you'll find if you ask for help, people will help you. Nobody's going to say, no, I cannot help you. So ask for help. And that's the only piece of advice I think that resonated with me last year is just ask for help. Thank you so much, Samara. It really links to this concept of community, solidarity, you know, not going it alone. Um, you know, even listening, Geraldine, to your story, uh, your partner, your husband, you know, supporting you um, and your family, uh, your parents at a time, I think, uh, when your children were young, also helping. Um, I think most of us realize you have kids. I've got three. It takes a village um, to raise uh, children. And I'm not ashamed to admit that myself, I have a wonderful husband, um, but more so I've got a big support structure and I don't think any of us could really do it successfully without that. But Geraldine, maybe coming back to the concept of robustness, resilience and anti-fragility in organizations, from your vantage point, sitting as a non-executive on some listed boards, um, you know, being involved in also uh, the education sector, et cetera, um, what do you think we can do at an organizational level um, to help us through this recovery from the pandemic? You've obviously seen in your career um, many shocks to the system, to the economy. Is there something more that leaders can do to prepare their organizations to come out stronger on the other side? We should never underestimate the impact of COVID and 2020 on all of us, on organizations, on communities, on individuals. Um, so there's no question that it's been a difficult year and 2021 hasn't started out any easier. So what could organizations do more? And in, in an interesting way, you know, I go back to this whole issue of black swan, when we spoke in the week, I was a little, little bit critical with you on the anti-fragility um, yeah, anti concept. But I, I sort of look back and realize that one of the big issues that has been raised by the author is the arrogance of people imagining they know more than they do. So to your whole point of what can organizations do more and better, I think for me, the first issue is recognizing that human capital, that the people in an, in an organization, in a company, in an institution and all, is they are very important. I mean, this is in essence the lifeblood of what really makes things work. But the second issue um, that we also underestimate is the whole issue of the strength of institutions and the importance to have strong institutions and systems. Where you really see complete collapse is where there's an absence of strong institutional structures. Then the third issue is also the adaptability of those structures 
or institutions to respond to a situation. So let me come back to my first point. I think we should commend people in organizations and even in homes for their responses during this period of COVID. The points, uh, the point that Samara raised around the fact that here you had parents in many instances, but in uh, a number of instances and to a larger extent than we would imagine, uh, women and single parents having to work and take care of children within one space. We're lucky, I think, as a panel, that there's greater resources available to us and to many people out there because we live in societies and communities with very high levels of inequality. And I believe that uh, COVID itself sort of heightened and surfaced inequalities. Uh, it was described by the UN Secretary General. He described COVID as placing an X-ray on the world and highlighting through that X-ray um, some of the inequalities in society to even a greater extent. So if we talk about struggling, imagine the worker lower down in the food chain who doesn't have the access to a stable internet uh, line, doesn't have access to data on demand, doesn't have access to even a private space within which to work. So I think there's a need for work environments for companies to take into account what the workforce, the circumstances is, what the circumstance is of the workforce and ensure that they provide the support systems required. And in addition to just providing the logistical support to ensure business continuity, there's an additional uh, aspect that was alluded to both by Noni and by Samara, the whole issue of the mental health of people. We shouldn't make an assumption that when you're working from home, it means you're in a more relaxed environment. Because I think the point made by both panelists is that people actually work longer hours. Because you are online, you work for 14 hours a day uh, and even more. So there's not really an end to your day unless you have a discipline to make that happen. So again, it's how, and, and this is where companies need to play a greater role, and it's both uh, those in the C-suite as well as your HR people, where they should ask themselves, um, are we ensuring that we're providing the support required to the workforce, and all, are we also taking into account the kind of support that should be given to frontline workers? Because the anxieties are different for those who are able to work from home as against those who have to work at the front line. So with Investec being in banking, and I'm also on the Standard Bank board, we know that those who have to go into the banks, much as we're moving more and more online, their anxiety levels are different. How do they get to work and all? So you've got to consider things differently because we are well developing a new normal and we cannot in a year from now talk about it as a new normal, as though there's been no lessons learned in the process. So I may not have answered completely uh, to the question you've raised, but I think that there's a number of complexities to take into account, and that's where anti-fragility comes to the fore. Thank you very much, Geraldine. I think some very interesting points raised, uh, particularly you know around um, people's welfare and some of the basics you mentioned. I, I think that's something that I also experienced. We we go back to a point in asking ourselves: uh, Are we listening to our people? Are we hearing what our people are saying? Um, and sometimes, you know, when I think about women in business in particular, they are not the first to speak up. Um, so there's an onus on, on us to actually ask the question, are you coping? 
What do you need to be successful? Um, and some of the answers, as you mentioned, mentioned Geraldine, are actually quite simple. Um, you know, I've seen it myself. It might be data. It might be access to transport technology. Um, some of the things we take for granted and the inequalities in society certainly start start showing up and in places we possibly didn't expect them to be. Um, and, you know, I just want to come back to you, Noni, on that point. I saw you really agreeing with what Geraldine has said. And if we're thinking about the new normal um, or the next normal, because I don't think it's, it's going to be static, um, do you think we're going to be going back to the way things were? Or what are the things that you think will change I've certainly enjoyed the flexibility of um, being able to spend more time at home, more time with my children, uh, but it has meant longer hours. And at times I'm not sure if I'm sleeping at the office or working from home. Um, that, that's become a blurred line for me. And the discipline is, is sometimes difficult to put in place when you're not driving from one place of work to home. Um, but, you know, in your view, Noni, what are the things that will stay and what are the things that will come back? Thanks, Rene. Um, yeah, just before I answer your question, I think, you know, as, as I was listening to, to Geraldine, and I think that the theme of this conversation is wonderful because we, we you know, people are, are coming to the fore in, in, in this discussion. And I think the one realisation that organisations should have by now is people are the lifeline of, of an organisation if there was ever any doubt um, and, and, you know, how you, how you approach that and what you do about it is, is critical to, to the survival, even thriving of an organization. So to answer your question, sure. Um, we, I think things are never going to be the way they were, which is, you know, for me is, is, is a good, is a good thing. I think we, we needed a reset. If I think of my life, before um, we went into this crisis, it was running at 100 miles per hour. And, and actually, in hindsight, I wasn't as effective as I thought I was. Um, you know, the one other lesson, certainly for me, is, um, you know, having to assess what's really important for me. Um, I think sometimes women grapple with, you know, consolidating their personal lives and professional lives. And, and I think most of the time, um, you know, your personal life or family uh, falls by the wayside because you are chasing, um, you know, this career growth and in the spotlight, you've got pressure there, but you think, you know, family will understand and I'll get back to them um, when, I, when I've got capacity. You know, we avoiding the fact that, uh, yes, we've had almost a revolution where we've been able to go digital and online in a manner that we never imagined we could in so short a space of time. But that has also come at a bit of a cost. So those of us who are in family units or whatever, it's okay, you know, where you have a partner, you have kids and all that. But what about the single people? How do they cope? It's also been a time of extreme loneliness an alienation, you know, so we should also bear that in mind. And I think this is not sufficiently looked at by companies, by organizations. There's a second uh, uh, aspect to this, and this is the fact that, you know, you don't engage in the same way you did before. So the link with parents, with grandparents and all that, I've had, I experienced my mother passed away in June last year, unrelated to COVID, but the way in which that funeral was conducted was completely different from what it would have been under different circumstances. So even dealing with mourning, dealing with grief and all, telling uh, my grandson, your great-grandmother passed away, it's... These difficult issues. So we also need to deal with different complexities and challenges because whether we like it or not, this is also going to impact on the way in which we function, on the business models that are out there. So it's it, it's really resulting in a fast forward in a different way. You know, it's all linking back to this concept of compassion community, solidarity, and and ultimately the human connection, which is what I think we all crave. 
Um, and the year behind us, I think for people in different ways have been exceptionally challenging, missing that human connection. Um, so I just want to come back to the lessons that we've learned um, and what we're going to take out you know, from, from this period during the pandemic. And maybe in closing, Samara, you know, what is the one key lesson uh, that you've learned that has helped you through this period, helped you be resilient, either at a personal or at an organizational le uh, level? Yeah, I actually want to touch on what Nani said, because, you know, it's kind of finding the purpose, because I think that's kind of the biggest part of how you actually get through the tough times. And, you know, what builds resilience to an extent, even in a corporate culture, is one, knowing who you are, knowing what you stand for, and knowing where you want to go. And I have a colleague who works with us who always uses a Grand Canyon example, because if the focus is to get to the Grand Canyon, you know, you might have a flat tire, your car might break down, but eventually you'll get to the Grand Canyon. You might take a little bit longer, you might take a completely different route. But as long as you know where you are going, you can actually roll with the punches. And I think that's also what we've done from an organizational perspective and also from a personal life perspective, you know, reevaluating the stuff that really mattered. And that really drives me from a personal perspective. And I think once you kind of set those down and you know who you are, where you want to be, what you stand for, um, you know, then, then it kind of helps you through the tough times. It helps you to say, okay, I've had a speed bump, but, you know, let's readjust, reassess, and let's move forward. And I think that's been, from my side, a big, big factor in terms of knowing from a corporate perspective, from a studio perspective, we here to widen access to higher education. That's why we exist. We are here to also make sure that our students actually get the experience that they need. You know, we are actually training, you know, for our students to go into the workforce and, you know, be the best that they can actually be and contribute to economic growth. And if you kind of have that as your focal point, you keep going because you have purpose in that. So I just want to touch on, I completely agree with what Nani said in, in terms of finding your purpose, you know, re-evaluating your purpose and, and actually keeping that as the guideline that helps you through these tough times. Thank you, Samara. Uh, it certainly resonates with me and I know it will resonate with a, a lot of leaders. Um, you know, from my perspective, I, I, I agree with you that North Star, both personally and as an organization, is critically important. The, the lens I would like to add to that is also um, not getting overwhelmed with all the input and the news and trying to focus on what you can actually contribute to, where you can make a difference. So to try and distinguish between where you can add value and where it's noise um, and really just honing in your your contribution to society or to the organization on where you can actually make a difference. So just to come back to you, Geraldine, then in closing, um, what is the one takeaway or one last thought that you would like to leave uh, with a woman in leadership as we close? I, I want to go to, uh, to draw on the unusual quotes. And that's of Helen Keller. You know, she said, and I, I, I want to get this right, she said, the only, uh, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. And I think that for me, when I looked at the uh, quote of hers this morning again, I thought this was so profound for this period that we are in. And, uh, you know, to the whole point earlier of purpose, but above all, just for the women of the world, you know, we've got to have that vision of the future that's important, not just for ourselves, but for the beautiful ones yet to be born. Because at the end of the day, 2020 and 2021 has reflected on the importance of people, the environment, and uh, to me, solidarity. And, and for women, 
and women in leadership and women aspiring for leadership uh, to occupy leadership positions, remember that nothing is impossible but ensure that you are able to assert it within a vision that determines the terms for what should be sustainable. And there are many things we could have talked about today, but I suppose that's another time. We are in 2021, and let's ensure that 2021 is, water, is a watershed year for women on the African continent, women in South Africa, women across the globe. And we are not going to move at, at the pace or allow the pace to be determined for us. It's been really a privilege to speak with you. And I think our listeners and those watching this webcast, are, are I'm speaking on behalf of them and thanking you for your insights um, and spending the time with us today. Thank you very much, Samara, Geraldine and Noni for joining us on this panel discussion today. It's very heartening to see the solidarity, the compassion, uh, shining through and women supporting women. So I hope for our listeners at home and at the organizations that you're at, that you have enjoyed spending the time with us and learning from these women in leadership.